Order, Minister of Health, to the service in public safety, wishes to make a statement to the House this morning. Uh, Minister. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to make a statement to the House on the critical issue of rising fraud, aware rising fraud awareness across the health and social care sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, just before I do that, I apologise for not being in my place yesterday uh, to move a, a particular piece of legislation. Uh, an opportunity had availed to meet the family of, um, of, of um, people who are in the public uh, realm at this time, a public spectrum, uh, to the abortion issue, and, and who have ladies, Kai and uh, twins, uh, which have no prospect of life outside of the womb. And uh, I, I was unfortunately a tad late, so I apologise for that, but that's the reason. I believe that this is an important opportunity to highlight the detrimental impact that fraud has on the HSC and, and what can be done to combat it. Health and social care is the biggest <coughs> spender of public resources in Northern Ireland, and those of us who provide these services have to be vigilant in the fight against fraud. Two weeks ago, I launched Fraud Awareness Month, the purpose of which is to raise awareness of the threat of fraud in the HSC. This provides a great opportunity to spotlight the serious problem and stress the importance of counter-fraud training and education. We have a duty to counter and report fraud and corruption wherever we work and by whomever it is perpetrated. Such activities are unprofessional and defensible and ultimately reduce the monies available for frontline service. Let me be clear, fraud is wrong, it is a criminal offence and won't be tolerated within the HSC. It is important to recognise that the vast majority of people are generally honest and would not consider acting fraudulently. This fact, however, can sometimes make it difficult to accept that a colleague or a fellow professional might act dishonestly, and there is general perception that the HSC staff are employed in the caring professions and are therefore in some way above such behaviour. But cases have come to light clinical professionals of considerable standing who make claims for services not supplied, nursing staff who claim grants for what they are not entitled, senior managers who claim for journeys never travelled, <coughs> support staff who undertake private work while on sick leave, and members of the public who try to evade payment for treatment, and the list goes on. This House will have heard in recent days about inappropriate access to free health care in Northern Ireland, and this is <coughs> one of the key areas of fraudulent activity for the HSC, where those not ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland fraudulently use Northern Ireland address to secure access to free health care services, both within the primary and secondary care settings. This activity represents a significant and inappropriate drain on health service resources. Fraud is by no means a victimless crime. In the health and social care setting, fraud can lead to direct financial losses through overpayments. It can damage the reputation of an organisation through public exposure of its perceived weaknesses, and it can indirectly lead to failure to provide sufficient care to vulnerable patients or clients because of the money has been lost to the system. In each of these examples, the general public is the ultimate victim. So, no matter what, it is clear that any type of fraud is wrong, whether it be for one pound or one million pounds. It robs the HSC of vital resources and means that there is less to be invested in frontline services. This is particularly evident in the light of the significant financial challenges currently faced by all public services. Put simply, every penny lost to fraud is a wasted opportunity. It means that someone somewhere is not getting the treatment that they are entitled to. We must therefore understand that we all pay the price for fraud. Every penny lost as a result of fraudulent behaviour results in a reduction in patient care. While the true extent of fraud in the HSC and indeed across the NHS nationally is not known, independent research across the health sector in a number of countries suggests the potential level of fraud may be between 3 to 7 per cent. Taking the highest figure, that equates to around a quarter of a billion pounds of my department's budget. However, even if the level of fraud was estimated at 1 per cent, this equates to some £40 million of my department's budget. That £40 million, which is not available uh, for investing in frontline services, and what would it buy? Well, for example, 4,000 coronary heart bypass procedures, or 55,000 cataract surgical procedures, procedures or 5,500 hip replacements, or 1,000 patients receiving renal dialysis treatment. My aim today is to raise the profile of the threat of fraud, and I would like to highlight what the HSC is doing about it. Firstly, everyone has a part to play in stopping fraud. Everyone who accesses health and social care services 
or works to deliver these services has a role to play in tackling fraud. And if we are to be successful in achieving this, we need to recognise that fraud is wrong, acknowledge the damage that it causes and report it effectively. It is therefore necessary to increase the levels of fraud awareness for everyone, not only HSC employees and those who work in healthcare, but also to the general public. It is everyone's duty to report fraud or suspected fraud, whether through, be through the HSC fraud hotline or through the HSC's online reporting tool, or indeed, indeed through the relevant organisations' whistleblowing procedures. Any information, no matter how small, can be of assistance in combating fraud. Secondly, there is already a significant amount of counter-fraud work being undertaken by the HSC's counter-fraud unit. This unit employs a team of trained specialised staff who have the responsibility for delivering a professional counter-fraud service across the HSC. The counter-fraud unit is currently investigating over 100 cases covering all types of fraudulent activity, and during the last year there have been some notable successes. Two owners of a business contracted to carry out domiciliary eye services were given 18-month jail sentences, suspended for two years, and £40,000 was recovered. Serious crime orders were awarded against the owners, which will prevent them from having any proprietary interest in any ophthalmic business for the next five years. An optometrist working for the business was struck off. The BSO's probity team provides assurance on the millions of pounds expended every year in family health services. This probity work is undertaken in collaboration with clinical advisors from the Health and Social Care Board. In the last financial year, over 400 probity checks and visits with family practitioners were performed, and just under £200,000 was recovered. We also ensured the removal of 108 people from GP registration lists. A robust investigation showed that these individuals were not ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland and were therefore not entitled to register for free access to our health and social care services. Our cross-border work is underpinned by a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Social Protection in the Republic of Ireland. This allows us to obtain information which will confirm whether a person who is claiming to be resident in Northern Ireland is also claiming to be resident in ROI and it greatly improves our investigation times. In addition, a new service, Eligibility to Access Health Services, was set up in June 2013 to provide advice and guidance to HSC trusts on how to deal with inappropriate access to health care. We are therefore serious about tackling fraud and will endeavour to ensure that it is punished appropriately. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would like to emphasise three key messages in the House. Firstly, fraud is wrong, it is unethical, immoral and unlawful. Secondly, we all pay the price. Frontline services suffer. There is less to pay for the treatment of patients. And thirdly, everyone has a role to play. We all have a responsibility to be alert to fraud, and we can all minimise the risk of fraud by recognising the potential risk of fraud, knowing what constitutes a fraud, and knowing how and when to report a fraud. As Minister, I am committed to developing a real anti-fraud culture across the HSC, where everyone regards fraud as unacceptable, and where everyone understands the role they can, they can play in eliminating it. I commend the statement to the House. Maeve McLaughlin, Chair of the Health Committee. Ms. Yes. Uh, I thank the Minister for her statement. Today, uh, I suppose every one of us um, should uh, have attention to uh, the requirement to ensure that we have a, an efficient and effective uh, health service. Uh, and I don't think that we can lose sight of the statistics that the Minister has uh, issued in a statement that even if the fraud was estimated at 1%, uh, that would be something in the region of £40 million, uh, in relation to the overall health budget. Um, however, Minister, I do want to um, specifically uh, ask, given the, the recent media highlight around specifically the figure of 80,000 uh, people who had been registered uh, for medical cards in the north, given the fact that there are issues whereby uh, residents in the 26 counties who are working in the north have that entitlement. Do we have an accurate figure in relation to that 80,000? I'm suggesting uh, that the figure is a lot less than that. And is there a specific issue around students' uh, accessibility to medical cards in the north? Uh, and finally, just the, the cost of the counter fraud unit, how much it costs to run, and what has been recovered. Uh, over the last year, Gurmogut. 
Well, first of all, in relation to the medical cards, in Northern Ireland uh, there is a mid-year population estimate in 2011 of 1,814,300 people. Uh, those registered with a general practitioner estimate in, in 2011 was 1,893,000, uh, which is 4.34 per cent of the difference. Um, in England, for example, uh, we had 53,107,200 people um, in the population estimate, and those registered with GP was 55,308,000, 4.14 uh, per cent difference. In Scotland, the difference is 4.34 per cent. In Wales, the difference is 3.24 per cent. So this isn't something which is peculiar to Northern Ireland. Um, this is something uh, which would appear to be happening across uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and in that respect, we we'll have to look at what the issues are. Uh, the member herself has mentioned one of the issues, uh, and that relates to students who um, come to uh, study here. They can rightfully claim uh, medical cards, uh, but very often, whenever they uh, leave this country, they don't give up their medical cards, and uh, therefore uh, they are not taken off the, the register. Uh, we would also have people uh, from Northern Ireland who have emigrated elsewhere or who have went to live elsewhere, uh, and whose name have not come off the medical cards. And very often, these people will have uh, died elsewhere as well. Uh, so those figures. Uh, uh, also um, add to the situation. And, uh, there are a, a series of, of other reasons. Some patients are registered in more than one practice simultaneously, and systems and processes are in place to capture these cases, um, but that still happens. So it is an issue of concern, uh, but there are reasons for the disparity, and it is not uh, particularly different from, from other places. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if we believe that there is information uh, there that can help us lead to, to clamping down on fraud, it's certainly something uh, that we'll be very interested uh, in tackling. In terms of uh, cases that, that have been uh, looked at over the course of, of the last number of years, I did mention the, the case of the ophthalmic, of the ophthalmic service. Uh, we've also examples of persons who have fraudulently obtained uh, prescription medication, and there's been conviction on some 50 separate offences, including a jail sentence. Um, and there was an arrest made on the 15th of, of, of March uh, 2013, uh, with potentially 80 separate counts. There has been a recovery of £25,000 in respect of one nurse who was falsifying timesheets. There has been involvement in civil recovery legal processes against pharmaceutical manufacturers over the last number of years, which has uh, netted recoveries in excess of £2 million. So there is work going on there to, to, to actually uh, secure uh, recovery of monies. The, the actual uh, fraud investigation team, as I understand, employs around five people, and uh, those people are very busy people. And uh, as we look to the future, that may be something that we consider uh, enhancing and strengthening further, uh, given uh, you know, what we're finding in relation to fraud. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and welcome this initiative against fraud. Can I ask the Minister what has been done to tackle people from the Irish Republic falsely claiming to be residents in Northern Ireland in order to use the health and social service provision? Well, there is a long-standing issue for the health service in Northern Ireland uh, uh, around this issue, and, and the extent of the abuse is, is unquantified at this point, but on the basis of evidence from known cases, it is a very significant issue. Uh, we recently signed a memorandum of understanding uh, between CFPS and the Department of Social Protection, and that has now been formalised and signed off in July of this year. And this will allow CFPS to obtain information which will confirm if a person who is claiming to be resident in Northern Ireland is also claiming to be a resident uh, in the Republic of Ireland. So that is uh, cross-border cooperation that, that I am very happy to endorse. And it will uh, significantly reduce the time scale um, of uh, our CFPS investigators. 
uh, investigations. Since uh, August 2012, CFPS has investigated some 108 ROI residents who were found to have falsely claimed to be resident in Northern Ireland. And all of those people have been remo removed from the NIGP registration system. And these cases have either been highlighted by whistleblowing reports or from related CFPS proactive work and has prevented um, a significant future drain on the Northern Ireland Health Service resources. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, can I agree that fraud is wrong, and the SDLP supports that fully and uh, uh, endorsing fraud awareness. But would the minister accept that uh, while we're dealing with potential dishonesty, it's also important to be honest with the public? And the goalposts of fraud that he has set here extend on one hand to 250 million, and the other to 40 million. And there's an inference there that on the bigger figure that more potentially NHS staff are implicated and in the smaller figure clearly less staff and would he agree that there is a need for accuracy in this regard? Well, well it's hard to be definitive in terms of accuracy. I think that the figure that, that I quoted was it is estimated to be, to be between 3 to 7 per cent which would be 120 to 250 million but nonetheless it's, it's a massive, massive gap between the two and I, and I accept that. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm not sure whether we'll ever, ever get to, to complete and total accuracy in this. Um, what I do think is that uh, you, you, when, when you look at um, the situation, when you look at the circumstances, um, I would expect that the low-hanging fruit will be the first uh, that the counter-fraud investigations will go after. Uh, but nonetheless, there will be a considerable number of others um, that will have to be addressed and looked at, uh, and as I indicated, whether it's one pound or one million pounds, um, nonetheless, it is wrong and, and, and deserves investigation. Roy Beggs. Mr. Beggs. I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, but can the Minister advise uh, what's been done to improve uh, the information in real time? Um, our GPs have a very sophisticated uh, computer system to track individual patients' health care and also to make performance payments to them. So, uh, ministers talked about two bedroom houses with 12 and 16 adults living in them. Can the minister advise why that computer system cannot be used to identify such situations in real times rather than having to wait for some form of historical data mining? No, uh, I didn't refer to, to two bedroom houses with 12 or 16 people living in them. I'm, I'm not saying that that, may, that isn't the case. Uh, I just don't know whether that's the case or not, and it may well be the case in some instances. It may well be accurate in some instances, uh, g g given uh, how some things are done. But in terms of the GPs, they, they are independent contractors <coughs> and they do own the IT systems. Um, however, the electronic care record may give us the opportunity um, to better address this issue. Uh, and in terms of bringing all of the information together, uh, I, I would expect that we will have full cooperation of the GPs. Uh, with the counter-fraud services uh, to ensure that we can identify better people who shouldn't be on the, the, the registered with GPs and have those people um, removed from the list. Many of the people don't pose a particular problem to us because they're not living in the country and they're not using the services, but they have remained registered. Um, but it doesn't seem a reasonable thing to, to seek to reduce um, that disparity that exists, that 80,000 disparity that exists. Uh, Albeit it's a disparity that is replicated across the UK, it isn't something uh, which is uh, novel to Northern Ireland. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Mr. McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister in a statement mentions whistleblowing procedures, and uh, we would all agree that that would probably be the best way of tackling fraud. But the, it's unfortunate to say that the department's record uh, and whistleblowers is not that good. I'm thinking about the fire and rescue lady that lost her job. Has the department done anything to assure whistleblowers that uh, their efforts will be listened to and welcomed and that they certainly will not lose their jobs? Well, as far as I understand, um, the case that he's referring to, the person still works in the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service uh, 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 and, and he hasn't lost her job, but nonetheless, I uh, wrote to everybody within uh, the health service and the fire and rescue service, every individual setting out um, what whistleblowing is about, 
indicating that we were offering them protection for whistleblowing, them, whistleblowing um, not just encouraging them to do it, but indicating that it was their duty where they saw wrongdoing to actually report that wrongdoing. So I am seeking to instil um, a culture within an organisation um, that whistleblowing is the right thing to do, it is the proper thing to do. I have to say that I, I am encouraged by um, the numbers of people who are coming forward and on a range of issues, um, indicating that, that they are very well aware of significant problems and that they want to see those problems addressed. And it is wrong that people actually knowing of wrongdoing live in fear of actually reporting that wrongdoing. That, 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 that is a, a, a further uh, punishment on those individuals. Individuals who know of wrongdoing should report it and should not have any fear for reporting it. And uh, that is something that uh, goes way beyond uh, the health service, but it's something that I want to instill within it. David Michael Veen. Mr. Michael Veen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd also like to thank the Minister for his statement this morning. Um, I wonder, could the Minister give us some examples that he's aware of, of, of other cases that might currently be with the PSNI? Well, in terms of that, I think that we need to be somewhat cautious in, in, in ongoing cases, but the, the police investigation is underway in respect of four vulnerable adults, for example, where it's suspected that they have been the victim of significant uh, financial abuse dating back to the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, we also have a, a bank nurse who has submitted timesheets uh, between uh, July and, and August 2010, um, all of which were fraudulent. Uh, a PSNI investigation is underway after concerns were raised as to the transportation policy um, operated um, by a care facility. And a PSNI investigation is underway into the issue of direct payments between April 2007 and July 2013 to the value of £72,500. I should say, in all of these things, an investigation is that it's an investigation and doesn't, uh, isn't an indication of wrongdoing. Uh, it is only an indication of wrongdoing when an investigation uh, is put to the PPS to indicate that a prosecution should take place and then a conviction happens in a court of law. So there is a number of investigations currently being carried out uh, by the PSNI in conjunction with our uh, fraud, fraud investigators. Dominic Bradley. Mr Bradley. I can call you to the school of the Arachis Eskest Tawaktak Isha Nilche and Glachy or Valak or B. Gamo and Nirisha Arigat Golomau Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, I agree with the Minister that it's totally unacceptable that uh, this amount of money or any, uh, anything approaching it should be uh, lost to our health system when there is such a need for it currently and always. Um, the Minister, uh, in the second page of his statement, says that it is necessary to increase the levels of fraud awareness for everyone. Um, well, could I ask the Minister how he intends to get the anti-fraud message across from everyone from the offices, offices of the top uh, administrators to the service users themselves and everyone in between? Well, thank you, Member, for the question. <coughs> question. Uh, uh, over the course of this month, there has been a number of opportunities that has arisen to, to highlight uh, the issue in a very public way. Uh, obviously, we launched it two weeks ago. Uh, on that day, I think I'd done six or seven different interviews uh, for media, so there was widespread uh, coverage in it. Obviously, we're doing our business today in the House, uh, <coughs> which m m may produce more coverage of it. Uh, so, people are very well aware of what is going on. Um, and people within the system are, are aware that, that more is being done to counter this. Uh, so I think that the highlighting of it uh, will actually help to reduce the amount of fraud, um, just because people become more aware that, that uh, they're, 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 they're <coughs> there is that level of, of scrutiny. And uh, I think that Fraud Awareness Month will greatly assist us uh, in delivering on this. Mrs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement in, uh, in which he recognises inappropriate access 
for free health care in Northern Ireland were those not ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland fraudulently used in Northern Ireland address to secure access to free health care services? Where health care is free in Northern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, I believe it costs 50 to 75 euros to, to visit a GP and 100 euros to visit a hospital. Will the Minister therefore ensure that each Northern Ireland hospital publishes on a regular basis the income it receives from treating patients from the Republic of Ireland so that this is kept in the public domain? Well, <clears throat> it is for the hospital to pass it on to, to the Department of Health, um, whose responsibility at a national level to, to recoup that money. Uh, so it isn't for the hospital themselves to, to recoup the money. And <clears throat> it's one of those difficult issues. You, you take, for example, um, you know, Alton McElvin Hospital or Daisy Hill, Hill Hospital, which is right in the border. Uh, on a Saturday night, uh, people arrive into the, the emergency department. Um, a little the worse for wear, having um, be, been out in some of the facilities in those uh, cities. Uh, clearly, many of those people will come from the Republic of Ireland because of its proximity to the border, uh, and therefore those are people who require treatment. They are not ordinarily resident uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, but we should be able to claim the money back off the Republic of Ireland. Now, it is a hospital's responsibility. Uh, to ensure that information is passed on um, to allow that to be the case. I think that the memorandum of understanding that we have uh, uh, signed with the Republic in July um, will be helpful in, in many senses. And I also think that recent European legislation, uh, which has been proposed um, and has been approved, um, will assist us in actually ensuring that we can claim back monies uh, from other places, not just the Republic of Ireland, but from other places uh, where people have used the Northern Ireland health care system, uh, which is free of charge, and where other people have to pay for, for similar services. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too welcome uh, the Minister's statement, and I think it's particularly helpful where he sets in context what the money lost uh, could have purchased in terms of services and surgery uh, for some of. Um, our citizens. But really to pick up on Mr McCarthy's point, it's my understanding, Minister, that the lady in question within the fire service was not given her old job back and therefore there is a very strong message that needs to go out that those people who do step forward to be whistleblowers are protected and they're not then uh, treated as though they were the wrongdoer. And so therefore does the Minister not agree with me that much more needs to be done in order to protect people who would step forward and be that whistleblower? Well, I'm not sure of the appropriateness of, of, of talking of individual cases in, in, in a public forum such as this. <clears throat> but in terms of, of whistleblowing, I outlined to Mr McCarthy very clearly the steps that we have taken to encourage people to whistleblow um, and the assurances that they have been given uh, in, in cases where they actually do whistleblow um, that they would be protected. And, and I've given that assurance that if they don't get satisfaction from their line managers, uh, that they move further up. Uh, the management chain, and if it needs to be, if people feel strongly enough about it, that's a, more, a significant enough issue, that they come right to the top of the organisation, uh, and that is um, a course that I have recommended people to take, and would encourage that to be the case. I'll call Mr. Jim Allister. Um, if fraud is, ex is as extensive as the minister says or maybe, and I'm not doubting that for one minute, does the Minister think that five members of staff in the anti-fraud unit is ever going to tackle that? Because if it's only five people, can they ever be proactive? Are they not always just going to be reactive to situations? And yet it's probably going to take a proactive initiative against fraud to deal with it. So what plans has he to increase the scale of fraud investigation within the department? Well, I, I tend to agree with the member, uh, and that is uh, something that is currently being looked at. Uh, so, whilst uh, the number is small, nonetheless, uh, the people within it are, are effective, uh, and they currently have a caseload, for example, of 100 cases um, under an investigation. Uh, we, we are looking at, at, at how it could be enhanced, but in all of these things, it involves investment uh, in, in, in difficult times and it will be taking money from some other service uh, to put in place the fraud service. 
However, the fraud service may well reap much more uh, income uh, than it actually costs us in terms of the, the work that they carry out. So it could be an investment which actually, which actually reaps a dividend and allows us to invest further in the health service. So that is something that, that people are currently looking at and addressing. Call Mr. Jim Wells. The Minister has outlined already the uh, work that he's carrying out in conjunction with the authorities in the Republic of Ireland. But I'm sure you'll accept that uh, this important task can only be carried out with the cooperation of a wide range of statutory organisations within Northern Ireland. Could you outline the other players of this important task? Well, obviously, with, within Northern Ireland, um, the PS and I are, are key players. Um, the general practitioners are key players. Uh, the departments in the Republic of Ireland uh, are key players. And in, in, in all of that, um, we will have to work very closely with all of those organisations in, in bringing issues forward and providing that call of information where it involves uh, taking people to court to the PPS uh, to ensure that, that that is something that they wish to establish. And of course, the, the, the main key players are actually the people within the organisations, because those are the people with the most information, and those are the people with the quality of information uh, that can be passed to ourselves that will actually allow us uh, to um, look at these cases, uh, to challenge the individuals who are involved in it, uh, to take the actions to recover uh, lost finances and to take actions to prosecute where that, that is suitable. So the, the, the most important player in all of this is the individuals, uh, who, 70, uh, thousand individuals who work within uh, the HSC and, and, and fire service sector. That concludes questions on this statement.